A veteran deputy on the other side of the law, accused of groping a dozen women while on duty. The charges he faces and why the DA is reaching out to the public for help. And I told him, hey, you know, um, I'm not finding any uh, apartments, two bedroom apartments in this price range that are higher. Federal help for housing. Vouchers could have helped low income families. Why San Diego is taking its own approach. A gubernatorial debate happening right here in San Diego. We'll tell you what candidates are taking the stage. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. A San Diego County Sheriff's deputy is under arrest today, accused of abusing 12 women while he was in uniform. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the allegations of groping and unwanted hugging first came to light in the fall of last year. Sheriff's Deputy Richard Fisher was arraigned in a courtroom here in Vista earlier this afternoon. His charges include sexual battery, assault and battery by an officer, and false imprisonment. The alleged crimes took place between May 2015 and October 2017. If he's convicted of all the charges, he faces up to 14 years in prison. Now, Fisher is on unpaid leave. He was placed on paid leave in October and unpaid leave last month. Uh, he is still employed by the Sheriff's Department, and Sheriff Bill Gore said at a press conference this afternoon that this case was handled as expeditiously as possible. I do want to reach out while I'm in this public forum to talk to the victims and, and, and basically talk to them about how disappointed uh, I am as the sheriff in the conduct of one of my deputies. And, and we take it seriously because we know that trust between uh, the, the, the police department, the sheriff's department, and the communities we serve is so fragile. And it's so important to us to, to provide for good public safety in this county. Now, Sheriff Gore said that the first recorded complaint was filed against Fisher in October 2017. But a victim did file another complaint in September of 2017 and that that case was not handled properly by the deputies. Gore said that an, a separate internal investigation is ongoing into that mishandling. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Four of his accusers spoke to KPBS's Amitha Sharma weeks before his arrest. They spoke on the condition of anonymity. My circumstances were that I had placed a call for um, a domestic violence issue threat against me. And so when he showed up at the door, I had invited him in to talk about what, what had happened previously in that night. And he did ask for a hug at that point. I mean, after I went through a few things or he said, you must need a hug or something. So we hugged. Um, and I just thought it was like a sympathy type hug. So then he hugged, he hugged me again. I can't remember how that hug came about. Uh, it was a, definitely a, a stronger hug. Mm -hmm. um, my son had come in at that point and asked if everything was okay and he went up to his room. Then as we were walking towards the door, um, he held me again, like just really close and tight. He held my butt um, and then he took my right hand and put my hand on his crotch and rubbed it a couple of times. And I was like, what, what are you doing? I mean, I am a respectful, classy lady. I'm, I don't know what you're thinking. What's going on? This doesn't happen. This is not, this is not real. Anyway, so then he, he did leave and he just said, you know, I'll, well, I'll keep an eye out for you or something like that. He did ask that I do not tell anyone about what had happened. The district attorney's office is asking for any other victims to come forward. You can find out how at kpbs.org. We'll continue to follow the case of Deputy Fisher on air and online at kpbs.org. State Senator Tony Mendoza resigned today following a sexual harassment investigation. The resignation followed an outside investigation that found he made repeated unwanted sexual advances towards multiple female staffers. The allegations date back to 2007. 
Today, President Trump lashed out at California's sanctuary state law. He claims California is not helping the White House with targeting the MS-13 gang. He suggested withdrawing immigration officers from the state. No help from the state of California. I mean, frankly, if I wanted to pull our people from California, you would have a crime nest like you've never seen in California. All I'd have to do is say, ICE and Border Patrol, let California alone. You'd be inundated. You would see crime like nobody's ever seen crime in this country. And yet we get no help from the state of California. They are doing a lousy management job. They have the highest taxes in the nation. And they don't know what's happening out there. It's a, it's a, frankly, it's a disgrace. The president made these comments during a White House meeting with state and local officials on school safety and gun violence. Tonight, people will have the chance to hear from gubernatorial candidates vying for the Democratic nomination. The first ever gubernatorial debate held by the San Diego County Democratic Party is happening right now at the Jacobs Center. That's where KPBS reporter Jade Heineman joins us. Jade. Hey there, Ebony. Well, when those four candidates walk out on stage, they're going to be greeted by a pretty large crowd he out here at the Jacobs Center. Uh, this debate kicks off the Democratic Party convention, and it's happening this weekend here in San Diego. The body will endorse a gubernatorial candidate, but first, people will have a chance to hear from the candidates. So I thought, as long as they're here in San Diego, <laughs> why shouldn't the San Diego County Democratic Party invite the candidates to debate so that we can all take a look at them and see who we like and where we want to go? One of these people will be the next governor of our state. And the candidates on stage tonight will be uh, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, former Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villa Viragosa, former superintendent of public instruction Delane Easton and state treasurer John Chung. And again, party delegates will vote on endorsing a candidate in the governor's race during the convention. And of course, this debate is one of those things that will help them make some of those decisions. Live, Jade Hindman, KPBS News. Thanks, Jade. As Jade mentioned, one of the people taking the stage at tonight's at tonight's debate is state's treasurer, John Chung. And today, ahead of the debate, I spoke to him about his take on major issues facing Californians and why he thinks he's the right person for the job. Why are you the best choice to be California's next governor? I'm a product of the American dream. My parents came to this country with nearly nothing. My dad, three shirts. Uh, two pairs of pants, uh, but you know, America was uh, and is uh, the most aspirational place. So, the uh, I want to make sure that my eight godchildren and all of California get to pursue their dream. I bring a different set of qualities and skill sets. I'm the only person that have served in all three financial offices, and so I have the know-how to make sure that we we can invest better uh, in education, in health care, making sure that we build a strong economic foundation. Here in California, there are a lot of families who are considered on paper middle class, but they're struggling to make ends meet, struggling to be homeowners. What can California do better? That's why I'm focused on it. What separates me uh, with the, uh, the others is I'm building more affordable housing. Uh, I ran for the financial offices because you're talking about people who are struggling in the middle class, right? They want to make sure that they can move into communities that provide great education. We had, uh, during that last recession, taken away billions of dollars from education. My cousin lives down here in the San Diego region. She talked about, John, what can you do to make sure that, you know, the uh, uh, her kids' uh, teachers didn't get pink slips, right? So that's why I was tough on the legislature. I was tough on the former governor. And I'm happy that California today has grown back to this world's sixth largest economy. I want to make sure that I build more affordable housing as the next governor. How can I demonstrate I'm serious? As a state treasurer, I reformed some of the rules and regulations. My second year as a state treasurer, 83% more new and rehabilitated housing. Right? Look at the others who govern cities. Right? Do they have, do they have a housing crisis? Do those th cities still have a housing crisis? We, we know the importance of early childhood education, but that can be another financial obstacle for middle class families. What's your, sta your stance on universal preschool? Yeah, it's actually my top priority. Uh, I've said it early on. I'm, I've been endorsed by the uh, California speaker and said, you know, why do you want to run? We have a long time friendship. I said early childhood education. Uh, when I was young, uh, 
and my mom also was an immigrant, she used to make homemade flashcards, right? So my sister, who was eight years younger, right, she started drilling around ABCs, one plus one, uh, and she said, John, right, the, uh, it doesn't seem that she would know it, but she does, right? When you're young, you start to process it, and you learn very quickly. I think it's really important. We see the great disparity uh, that happens uh, with people who have greater access. Kids' neural development forms very quickly, a few days into birth. Uh, we need to make sure that we're, you know, reinforcing it, we're growing it, uh, and also not only early childhood education, we need to make sure that there's child care available so that parents don't have to make that choice about making sure their child gets an education or going out, off to work. Lastly, wrapping up, what should the voters of California know about John Chung? Yeah, well, John Chung is the one who stood with them, uh, fought for them when things were tough, right? When we had the financial crisis where other politicians didn't have the financial expertise or the courage to stand up, I challenged Governor Schwarzenegger. I fought to make sure that this state didn't go off the fiscal cliff, right? I got us back into a better financial position. I, I, I protected them, not Sacramento interests, right? I didn't pay the legislature when they kept passing phony budgets, right? And I am doing the hard work today in the face of President Trump to make sure that we continue to provide for education, that we continue to build more housing for the state, that we're protecting health care as I just drew for them. Because I understand, like I said at the earlier part, my, my mom and dad's dream for America, that's my dream for all of them. And so I am the person who's taking the action so that you can live the California life that you want. We'll continue to profile candidates in the governor's race as part of our election coverage. We'll have more on air and online at kpbs.org. 16 months ago, residents at three El Cajon mobile home parks learned they had been living for years above a toxic plume. They were then offered a chance to have their homes tested to find out if a cancer-causing gas was seeping into their houses. Here's iNews source reporter Nicole Tuiao with an update on what the test found. Air quality tests that began last year are measuring how much trichloroethylene, or TCE, might be getting inside the mobile homes from the toxic groundwater plume. So far, 150 of the homes in the Starlight, Greenfield, and Villa Cajon parks have been tested. Eight required better ventilation, so the air inside the houses is safer to breathe. Dr. Mary McDaniel is a consultant overseeing the testing for Amatech, the company responsible for cleaning up the plume. What we're trying to do is make sure that people are safe in their homes and feel safe in their homes. So it's important to see whether um, levels of vapors are coming into people's homes that could be harmful. Some of the levels detected inside the homes were more than double what the state says is safe. McDaniel says the levels are still far below what could cause health problems. So what we're looking for is very low concentrations of these chemicals. Um, just to make sure that, that folks are not exposed. An additional 63 homes will be tested this year, and ventilation improvements continue to be made to those that need it. For KPBS, I'm iNews Source reporter Nicole Tiao. iNews Source is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. The Lilac Hills development is back. Voters rejected it two years ago. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John says the county planning department is now recirculating an environmental impact report, and the public is invited to weigh in. The new Lilac Hills Ranch project looks similar to the one that was defeated by 64% of San Diego voters in 2016. It would build the same number of homes, 1,700, on land currently zoned for about 100 houses. The area is in semi-rural Valley Center, east of Interstate 15 and north of Escondido. But project manager John Willing says the new development team has improved the project. Now it's a, it's a, it's a meaningfully better plan than it, than, it, than it was back then. We've added over two dozen new features to the, to the project. Now it's carbon neutral, all the homes are zero net energy. We're doing a two dozen um, road, off-site road improvements, a new fire station or a remodeled fire station, a new school. 
Opponents of the original Lilac Hills project say they cannot understand why a plan that was rejected by more than 700,000 San Diegans less than two years ago is back on the table. But the developers hope that public attitudes have changed as the shortage of affordable housing becomes more critical. The makeup of the County Board of Supervisors has also changed. If the supervisors were to approve the project, it may not need to go to a public vote. However, there's another twist in the story. Opponents are currently collecting signatures for a ballot initiative that would require voters to approve any project like this that needs an amendment to the county's general plan. Voters have till April 9th to comment on this plan. Alison St. John, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, President Trump considers the arming of teachers and new gun restrictions. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. Bundling up for a wet, chilly day in San Diego. This was the scene at San Diego State University today, and we may see another round of rain maybe heading our way. Justin Povic has more in tonight's forecast. Well, to wrap up the work week, it will be in a bit of a showery regime. We're not talking about any heavy rain coming back into play, but potentially, again, a couple of minor travel delays. A little bit of wind out there as well. Crest line, again, areas north and east over the mountainous terrain. And we're looking at you know, some warmer temperatures coming up for this weekend as well. And that's when the sunshine will return. But right now we're tracking a couple of showers out there. Again, a notice uh, from Oceanside points uh, south and east toward Alpine. Again, nothing here that's going to be tremendously heavy or really reduce visibility all that much, but still the potential for some minor impacts. And notice as we lift north, that's where the bulk of the moisture is right now. Slide gets way down in our direction. So again, along the Sierra Nevada, the Sierra Crest, talking about travel impacts along Interstate 80, eventually getting in toward Tejon and Cajon Pass. We're going to be talking about some wintry weather as well. For tonight, though, partly cloudy. We dropped down to 51. Again, lingering clouds in place. And again, that's the case here as we talk about the numbers falling off into the lower 40s. 42 again, Oceanside. Higher terrain, of course, going to be cooler than that, dropping off into the 30s and even some 20s. And then for tomorrow, notice again some sunshine around as daytime high temperatures climb back into the 50. So again, Alpine tops off at 51, San Diego 59 degrees. Notice toward Oceanside right around that 60 degree mark. But let's venture on further down the road because it's been busy in the West and we're going to continue to be on the busy side here as we go through time. Again, notice all the wet conditions here over the Pacific Northwest. These are going to be coming crashing down. So let's check out the uh, coastal area here as we go through time. And notice a morning shower possible heading in toward our Friday. Otherwise, lots of sunshine here as we go throughout the extended. And again, notice as we venture inland, we're talking about lots of sunshine. Temperatures into the 60s, close to 70. Rain possible, though, as we venture into early next week as another storm system rolls in. Mountainous terrain, a little bit of snow at times for Friday. And then the sunshine breaks free as we venture into the weekend. Desert also looking on the sunny side. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Justin Povic. Back to you, Ebony. The high cost of living in San Diego is no surprise. It's forced a lot of families to leave the city and even the state. It's also pushing poorer, often minority residents into certain neighborhoods. However, a federal housing voucher plan aims to change this by helping San Diegans who want to live in more expensive areas. But the city isn't using the program. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser has more. I wish I could find a place that's more kid-friendly. Margarita Diaz opens the front door of her apartment in City Heights. She lives there with her 11-year-old son and 8-year-old daughter who share the one bedroom. This is what I call the kids' room. This is what I set up for them, and I just sleep on the couch. Diaz spent 10 years on a waiting list to get a housing voucher, also called Section 8. She finally received one in 2015. So when I applied for Section 8, I thought, oh, well, cool, you know, now I'll be able to move into just either an, a better community. She had her sights set on apartments in La Mesa or North Park. When I first got my voucher and I started looking, I think two, three weeks um, into it, I called my, um, the person that's in charge or that I'm supposed to contact at Section 8, and I told them, hey, you know, um, I'm not finding any uh, apartments, two-bedroom apartments in this price range that are higher. 
She pays 30% of her income toward rent, and the voucher covers the rest up to a certain limit, $1,304 for two-bedroom apartments, which is paid directly to the landlord. She couldn't find an affordable apartment in another neighborhood, so she stayed in her current place in City Heights. The new federal program might have changed things for Diaz's family. Before the program, a housing voucher was calculated using the median of all rents in the city. Under the federal program, a housing voucher is calculated using the median rent in the zip code where the family wants to live. That means families living in more expensive neighborhoods get larger housing vouchers so they can afford the rent there. So if Diaz's family wanted to move to North Park, they could get about $1,600 in a housing voucher for a two-bedroom apartment instead of about $1,300 using the citywide median. But that's not what San Diego is doing. We decided that that was too complicated. It was too burdensome. Rick Gentry is the CEO of the San Diego Housing Commission. At the beginning of this year, it rolled out its own program that's like a scaled-down version of the federal zip code-based program. It would give families like the Diaz's more money to live in better neighborhoods, but not as much as they'd get under the federal program. For example, under San Diego's program, they'd get about $1,700 if they wanted to move to Point Loma. Under the federal program, they'd get $2,000. Gentry says he doesn't want to use the federal program because it would slash voucher amounts for people living in the lowest-cost neighborhoods. It would have harmed families living in a more traditional, lower-cost areas in order to help families live in higher-cost areas. So we decided that was beyond providing choice and assistance. That was social engineering in punishing families to remain where they are. However, any housing commission can choose to not decrease voucher amounts for families who stay in lower-income neighborhoods, something called a hold harmless provision. Gentry also worries the federal program would drive up voucher amounts, which would mean fewer people get vouchers overall. A simple algebra. If the money, if the rents increase enough, so that we don't have enough money to cover 15,500 families, we start lopping families off the list. Dallas has been using the zip code-based system for almost 10 years. Leaders of its housing authorities say it didn't require hiring any extra staff and didn't cause anyone to lose their vouchers. And Parisa Ijadi Maksudi, a San Diego poverty attorney, says the reasons against using the zip code-based program missed the point of the program in the first place to desegregate cities. We're so racially and class segregated right now um, that moving forward immediately is what needs to be done. It's just hard incrementally changing the, um, the way our neighborhoods in San Diego are, are made up. Margarita Diaz says she and her family would like a larger voucher to move to a different neighborhood. When her apartment flooded, she and her two children moved in temporarily with her brother in Chula Vista. My kids really liked it. When we came back, my son's like, Mom, I don't want to live in the ghetto. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. The Housing Commission says it will review its voucher amounts in the first six months of this year and could potentially increase them for next year. Thinking of retiring in San Diego, a recent report ranks America's finest city near the bottom of the list of places to retire. People who live here know the cost of living is high. But KPBS producer Nico Will says the report makes concrete some of the vague fears San Diegans may have when planning for their future. Out of 261 cities in the nation, San Diego came in at 249th. The ranking was compiled by Smart Asset, a personal finance company based in New York. The main reason San Diego is a tough place to retire is housing costs. They're high. The study estimates a retiree will need about $20,000 a year just to cover housing. McAllen, Texas is number one in the rankings. Housing costs there run closer to $6,000 a year or less than a third of the amount needed to live in San Diego. If you have a million bucks saved up, you can enjoy more than 40 work for years in McAllen. In San Diego, a million will last you less than 20. Seth Kaplowitz is an attorney and finance lecturer at San Diego State. He says San Diego is expensive because it's a desirable place to live, with its beaches and sunshine almost every day. And while the high cost of living makes retirement here restrictive, some are willing to pay it. People are paying for the luxury of living in San Diego between 
property taxes and state income tax and just the general cost of survival, um, it's really a luxury to be able to choose to live in San Diego. To me, it's the closest place to living in Bali in the continental United States. Kaplowitz says if you want to stay in San Diego in your golden years, you may have to live more modestly than you would in other cities. Or, he says, you can get creative. Maybe move to Tijuana, where you're still close but it's not as expensive. Or do as some people he knows do, and spend most of your time as an expat in another country, where your dollar will go further. And when you're stateside, see if your kids will put you up. They get together with their children, and they get a, like a, a granny flat that they have a place to come to when they're in the States, but their dollar just goes further when they're not in the States. Kaplowitz does warn that if you haven't already, you need to start planning and saving for retirement. If you haven't prepared for it, you're going to be working a long time. Nico Will, KPBS News. It was another successful launch for SpaceX this morning. The California-based company sent a recycled rocket into space, carrying three satellites. The launch created a brief slight show after blasting off from Vandenberg Air Force Base and arching over Los Angeles. SpaceX reuses rockets to reduce the cost of space light flights. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.